Our final presenter this afternoon is Guha Shankar, who is the Folklife Specialist in the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. His responsibilities at the center include planning and producing public educational outreach initiatives. In that capacity, he serves as project director for the Civil Rights History Project, a national initiative of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. The project is one of the subjects of his talk today. Guha also develops and conducts skills-based documentary training programs in collaboration with local communities and cultural and educational uh, uh, institutions in the US and abroad. He has experience and training in media production, archival media preservation, and is involved in ongoing projects pertaining to knowledge repatriation and intellectual property and cultural heritage management initiatives for traditional communities. He will presenting Please Mind the Gap, Civil Rights Collections Then and Now in the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. Please welcome Guha. Hi, uh, thank you all for coming very much. Uh, it's late in the day, and I uh, appreciate you all sticking around even on a gorgeous day like it is outside. Um, my aim is to talk a bit about gaps today from a couple of different perspectives, and also about tools, strategies uh, that can be employed to bridge uh, in some way, shape, or form those gaps. Um, one perspective that I employ here is that if a staff member at an educational and cultural institution who shares the responsibility with many others to both preserve and make available uh, the research, research collections that we hold. Um, in that regard, I will survey a couple of collections of cognate materials and talk about some technical challenges and solutions to making those records accessible both to patrons and to our uh, institutional partners. Uh, from the second perspective, which is that of a folklorist and social historian, there are conceptual and discursive problems that arise um, and the parameters of scholarly investigation and research are framed too rigidly. Uh, another way of saying this is that as mediators between the raw research uh, data in our uh, institutions uh, and our audience out there in the world, we have to be wary uh, of the categories and boundaries within which social, political, and cultural events and actions are framed. Uh, I note this because in the interest of uh, setting well-defined boundaries and focusing our uh, patrons' attention on the stuff that is really important, uh, we may well overlook the uh, uh, crucial place of seemingly ancillary actions, uh, actors, and stories that fall outside those arbit arbitrarily constructed compartments. So enough for the preamble. Um, I'm going to bookend my presentation uh, with two stories from the barricades not that long ago. And if you'll excuse me, I have to make a slight uh, uh, move over to the uh, movie side of things. Um, and what I'm going to uh, do is uh, uh, foreground a story by Chuck McDo, who, um, let me just see if I can find it, sorry. Uh, Charles McDo, uh, who recalls a moment in time some 53 years ago, uh, when as a 22-year-old college student in South Carolina, he wrestled with the ghost of Mahatma Gandhi and confronted the flesh and blood Martin Luther King, emerged from the experience alive and well, and went on to do great work. So let's see if we can find this one. And how did you get from February of 1960 to Raleigh for the SNCC founding conference? Well, I became the head of what we call the Orangeburg Movement for Civic Improvement. I became the student leader for the uh, student pro protest in uh, Orangeburg. Uh, and we were having sit-ins, we were having Wait-ins. We, we 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 were testing all these things, uh, challenging all these things, and and so I started getting arrested. I remember being arrested in uh, in uh, Columbia as we t 
took a petition to the governor, then uh, Governor Hollings, Fritz Hollings, uh, to ask that there be no longer, the laws against going to public places, libraries, beaches, parks, be struck down. And uh, I went to see Governor Hollings, uh, was arrested because black people were only allowed to be on, at the Capitol like between the hours of four and six on Sunday. Uh, so you can't do any business in. So I went there at 10 o'clock on a Monday and was arrested and put in jail. Well, that was just one of many. That was a, I led a group of students uh, to deliver a petition in Orangeburg to the city to ask that public places be desegregated. And uh, about 800 of us were arrested. And so while this was going on, got a letter from um, Dr. King at Southern Christian Leadership Conference that there would be a meeting of students um, at uh, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina uh, to discuss the student sit-ins. That took place in April 1960. I attended that meeting as a representative of the South Carolina State students. And, uh, and we were there discussing the movement and with, with students from all over uh, the South. Um, during that meeting, uh, Dr. King felt we should all join SCLC. Um, I disagreed, even because Dr. King felt if you join, if you use the practice nonviolence, uh, that you should accept nonviolence as a way of life in your life. I disagreed with that because I said yes, I use nonviolence and we use nonviolence, but it's. For me, it was strictly a tactic. And I, I didn't believe, and, and personally, I didn't believe it would work. It was a tactic that I think had a short, I felt had a short life and wouldn't work. My position was when, uh, when Gandhi uh, tried nonviolence in South Africa, uh, he was beaten, jailed, run out of the country. As I said, in, in the United States, uh, nonviolence won't work. Because when Gandhi used in India the tactic of having people lay down on railroad tracks to protest, I said, and it worked. I said, but if a group of black people lay down on railroad tracks here, in, Miss, in South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana, any of these southern states, a train would run you over and back up to make certain you are dead. You cannot make a moral appeal in the midst of an amoral society. And I said, felt it was not immoral. We lived in a society that was amoral. And as such, Nonviolence was not going to work. And uh, so said I couldn't, and the people with me could not join Dr. King. And, uh, and thank you, but no thanks. And then said those you know, people said who, who grieve who think like I do, we'll have a meeting down the hall and talk about it. And that meeting we had down the hall became the first meeting. Uh, the, it was the genesis of 
the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, it was at that meeting at Shaw Raleigh, uh, Shaw Campus in April 1960 that we went down the hall and talked about forming a new group. And at first we were going to call that group the Student Coordinating Committee and we were just going to exchange ideas between campuses. But there were some people in the group <clears throat> who were still, who still greatly believed in nonviolence and the viability of, of, of nonviolence and the practices of nonviolence. Um, and we felt they should be a part of the group and most of those students were from uh, Nashville um, and had been taught by uh, Jim Lawson. And I knew Jim Lawson and he was an important person to me. And so we thought that was good, it was a good thing to include nonviolence in our title. And so we created this new group and called it the Student Nonviolence. Coordinating Committee. Right. Stop there for just a second. And okay. So, Chuck McDo's story is one of uh, several dozen that have been recorded for the Civil Rights History Project a national initiative to record, preserve, and eventually provide access to the recollections of individuals who participated in the civil rights movement, the mass movement to secure justice and equal rights for African Americans in the last, uh, in, in the decades of the 60s, 70s. The U.S. Congress authorized a national initiative by passing the Civil Rights History Project Act of 2009, or Public Law 111-19. The law has had several consequences. I'll begin with uh, something close to home, and I'll talk about the consequences that it's had for our collections acquisition and management processes. And accordingly, as you might imagine, the law is at once enabling and also constraining. Let me speak to the enabling part of it first. The public law focuses attention on the experiences of men and women who participate in the struggle for securing, as I said, the civil rights of African Americans in the latter half of the 20th century. It enjoins the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's Museum of, uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture to document and make available these stories. To that end, the two institutions have divided up project responsibilities, and the, which are split between documentation on the one hand and collections management on the other hand, to put it crudely. The American Folklife Center launched the project with a major uh, nationwide survey of extant collections of recorded interviews and repositories of various kinds, uh, ranging from private individuals to large public repositories, university archives, and libraries, as you see here. The results are available for public access via the searchable survey portal. Uh, it's not the first such survey, but in our estimation is the most comprehensive one, and the portal will be maintained and updated as users provide us new information for the foreseeable future. Uh, and in a uh, tip of the hat to a uh, uh, home folks here, this is from the University of Missouri, Kansas City's collections. Uh, the uh, uh, collection that you see here is a Walt Bodine collection. Um, and by the way, that's a, a, a shameless invitation for you all to look into the collections and identify any gaps that you might find and pass them on to us. Thank you very much. Um, subsequently, uh, shortly after the survey was launched, the NMAHC began the process, uh, a documentary process, by contracting with the University of North Carolina Southern Oral History Program uh, to produce uh, the interviews uh, beginning in late 2010. To date, a two-person documentary team has produced the interviews. The uh, team is mostly uh, composed, uh, primarily composed of the terrific ethnographic filmmaker, uh, John Bishop, who does the shooting, uh, as you see, and a trained historian who serves as the interviewer. Uh, these interviews have principally been uh, Virginia Tech historian David Klein uh, and Joe Meunier, uh, both of whom uh, who are graduates of the Southern Oral History Program, and also on other occasions, uh, scholars such as Julian Bond, uh, Taylor Branch, uh, Dr. Patricia Sullivan. The interviews have already added significantly, it's it, to my estimation, to the collections of the National Library. And even though the project will uh, itself has two more years to go before it's complete. 
In terms of content, uh, the voices and stories of veterans of the movement like Chuck McDew are compelling. They demand our unbroken attention and provoke the realization that the struggle for civil and human rights is continuous and ongoing, as all of the individuals who have been interviewed for the project to date uh, are quite forthright about saying. The project enables us in the AFC, uh, at, at the AFC and elsewhere, to reflect on and consider anew the always present social, political, and ethical dimensions that underpin folk life research and documentation and archival and library practice as well. The project compels us to renew our disciplinary commitment to helping maintain the social compact by providing the space and means for a multiple range of voices to be heard in the public sphere. And I invoke the uh, spirit of uh, Stud Strakel, who's, uh, about whose work we heard this morning. Continuing with the notion of enabling uh, legislation, in the technical realm, the legislation provided the uh, AFC to uh, enable the AFC to undertake the development of a collaborative cataloging application in the Oracle Apex platform. This is not for public consumption. This is a very internally focused uh, uh, database. Um, what it does is, um, it's a first of its kind of ALC. It enables metadata collection to take place almost immediately after the interviews are recorded in the field by the creators of the uh, documentation. The information is subsequently available to all project partners at the same time, and records can be edited, remediated, added to, and shared in the common workspace, and complete catalog records can be produced in a very short time, a mere few weeks uh, after interview items of the AFC, which is, uh, since some contrast to the week, to the months, or even years may sometimes take for such processing to occur. I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail because it's uh, too bloody small up there, but I'm certainly happy to uh, show it to you after the fact. Um, in any case, what you have is boilerplate information which is entered into each catalog record. It's a collaborative process, as I said. Um, you have uh, folks from the uh, University of North Carolina, the project managers will enter information, uh, biographical data, as a guide to the interviewers who are going out into the field. The interviewers in the field, for instance, can then go through, write summary notes. Uh, and one of the most interesting features for us is, if you look in here, uh, at the, at the interviewer notes, you have a, a personal note from, which won't be made part of the public record, but it sort of alerts us in this instance, uh, us meaning the uh, Museum of American History, African American History and Culture and the, and the uh, library, that you have a, a, a potential donor who has collections of materials for acquisitions and we better get on it right away. So that I think is one of the great salutary features of it. And on the side you see, for instance, over there to the right, digital items. These are all the digital files that are produced in conjunction with the interview. Um, let me just note that uh, it, it took uh, uh, literally the movement of hell and high water to get this uh, uh, being made, to be made available to a very limited set of users. Um, the Library of Congress uh, demanded uh, some sort of blood sacrifice and or firstborn children. I found out later that uh, Bert Lyons promised uh, his firstborn child, but it turned out that he promised mine. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't have to worry about that, so I'm not, I don't really care that much. Um, so staying in the technical realm, let me mention to you that uh, uh, this is the first, first born digital video collection that the AFC has brought into its fold in high def, and um, at high def at that. Uh, I will note under my breath that the first six interviews which are recorded on tape were done so by the Smithsonian on very short order on a contingency basis, and thus do not really adhere to the guidelines that we established for video capture. Um, I love all my children equally, but some of them I don't speak about uh, in public. So leaving that aside, uh, the advent of high definition tapeless capture on the documentary side of things sets a qualitatively new standard and one that will undoubtedly play a part when considering the collections that we take in from now on. Now we see the beginnings of one gap. Um, here is the Civil Rights History Project collection to date. Uh, by the way, I need to acknowledge the presence of uh, a colleague of mine, Maggie Cruzy, who has done uh, stellar yeoman and uh, outstanding work, as she always does, on uh, getting collections materials uh, prepared and ready for uh, discovery. Um, if you, when I say the word catalog, all I should turn to her. So don't look up here. Um, so, uh, as I've said, let me see, uh, keeping the technical characteristics of the uh, Civil Rights History Project collection in mind, and a point specifically to the bolded stuff which says 50 interviews, 317 video files, all in high definition, uh, Apple ProRes uh, 422 HQ, uh, which adds up to about 90 hours or 8.5 terabytes worth of material from 50 interviews. Um, let us take a look then at what we're dealing with and trying to both preserve and make other 
uh, collections, the cognate collections I uh, that I mentioned before that have silverite content available. The first image you see here describes the extent of the National Vision and Leadership Project collection. It consists of oral histories conducted with elders in the African American community. Uh, they have lived the better part of their lives in the 20th century. Persons interviewed include educators, scientists, authors, community activists, and so on. Uh, many of the interviews are well known, uh, including Shirley Chisholm, Dick Gregory, um, Coretta Scott King, who has passed on, Dorothy Height, who has passed on, Odetta, who has passed on, Gordon Parks, who has passed on, um, Faith Ringgold. The collection consists of 996 master video recordings of 301 interviews, along with uh, uh, assorted materials. And if you look for the, what we've done here in this instance is we have actually uh, started the process of digitizing those analog uh, carriers, uh, which uh, gave us 1,629 files and some incomprehensible number expressed in bytes. Uh, have no, I, don't, I don't even know, what, don't know where to begin with uh, doing I just I threw that up there because I, this came off the uh, digital inventory and I thought it was too surreal to actually uh, you know, not be made public. Um, and then the next collection we're going to take a peek at is the Voices of Civil Rights Collection, which consists of oral history interviews. Oops, I'm now running on battery power, oh dear. Um, sound and video recordings, photographs and manuscript materials, documenting the memories of the civil rights movement for the Voices of Civil Rights Project. The initiative is sponsored by the American Association, thank you, uh, of retired persons. Uh, the manuscript submissions consist of correspondence for ARP members and the general public who responded to invitations in the ARP magazine, ARP bulletin, and parade magazine in 2003 and 2004 uh, to send in written vignettes of 500 words or less describing their civil rights experiences. Subsequently, beginning in uh, Washington, D.C. in uh, 2004, August, journalists and AARP staff uh, traveled uh, on an AARP-sponsored bus tour to 48 cities in the South, Midwest, and Western United States to collect audio and video oral histories. And again, the, uh, and, and audio, as you can see, the bolded uh, uh, titles that give you a sense of the various carriers that you have, which is, represents the uh, highlight of the worst formats of our decade, uh, I would say. Um, on the other hand, the material they contain is priceless, so there's nothing to be gainsaid from that. Uh, what I'm crudely trying to do, uh, point out in these cases, the contrast I'm trying to uh, draw between collections then and now, is that a whole lot of work has to be done to preserve and make uh, accessible materials of widely varying provenance, usability, and uh, various stages of obsolescence. We have on our hands the last two collections that I mentioned, recorded media that ranges from god-awful to awfully good in terms of technical specifications and quality and documentation and contextual information. Uh, and uh, the all-important metadata runs the gamut from non-existent and or fragmentary to robust and full. Um, so there is, uh, or was, a large distance between the CRHP interviews of recent vintage and the N NVLP and VOCR materials. The gap has been closed considerably over the last year and a half, I'm happy to report. Uh, due to digitization uh, uh, efforts that we've undertaken in conjunction with uh, external vendors, notably George Blood Audio. Um, I, parenthetically, I'll note what Brandon's, uh, one of the slides that Brandon had about a wonderful project that is made all the more remarkable by the fact that it's under, that's unfunded. Uh, the project is an unfunded mandate, so in essence, uh, the library has basically stolen its own coffers to pay for all of the work that we've had to do. Uh, your taxpayer dollars are not working in this instance, so, or working sort of oddly. Um, so, as I said, the gap has been closed considerably. The proliferation of several formulations of videotape and audio carriers was solved by the transformation of these formats, uh, at least in the short term, to file-based media. Relatedly, the, pr the problem of producing catalog records for, for, for all of these interviews uh, has been overcome by hiring a dedicated project cataloger, and the interviews for these collections are either not discoverable in the LC online catalog by AAD finding it or will be made so shortly. So, oof, running fast. How are we doing on time? Excellent. Yeah, all right. So, let me um, shift from the, this technical dimensions and, and talk uh, a little bit about the conceptual and, and the discursive problems that arise from the pr parameters of scholarly investigation research are framed uh, a little too narrowly. Here, the gap. Uh, uh, that I that I want to point attention to uh, lies between the legalistic and predominant view of the civil rights era as occupying a distinct span of years 
in contrast uh, to other scholarly views, which are emergent ones, which argue for a much wider and longer duration for the struggle for black, for black freedom. So the public law, which authorizes the LC and the SI to conduct uh, interviews and make them publicly available, uh, explicitly says, and I'm quoting from the public law, civil rights movement means the movement to secure racial equality in the United States for African Americans, that, the key term, focusing on the period 1954 through 1968, challenged the practice of racial segregation in the nation and achieved equal rights legislation for all American citizens. We can assume that the periodization rests in the first instance on the 1954 landmark Supreme Court ruling in the Brown versus Board of Education Topeka, Kansas case that desegregated school systems across the U.S. In the second instance, 1968 is the year of Dr. Martin Luther King's murder. In the world of historical research, scholarship on the topic, uh, Jacqueline Dowd Hall, Professor Emerita from UNC Chapel Hill, is attached to the phrase of the long civil rights movement. The phrase, but perhaps not the concept itself, first made its public debut in the Journal of American History in Hall's article, The Long Civil Rights Movement and the Political Uses of the Past, 19, in 2005. In the article and on subsequent uh, reworkings and writings on the topic, Hall and other scholars argue uh, for a longer and wider view of the struggle to secure equal rights for African Americans than a narrow focus on legal actions, legislative fiats, and other formal definitions would allow for. Adhering too faithfully to such a narrow definition of the struggle, that which is confined to a single decade or so, would preclude providing access, if you were a kind of pinheaded librarian, to collections that would be out of scope according to these narrow definitions of the struggle. So what then would happen if you were to serve only those materials which had civil rights in the title, or you only provided access to that? You would miss out on a whole host of experiences. And particularly in our collections, I'm reminded that a scant uh, six years before the experiences that Chuck McDo recounts, uh, eight years before, sorry, Big Bill Brunzi uh, talks to Alan Lomax about his experiences of growing up, of having come back from the war, World War II, the segregated South, and voting with his feet and having to eventually leave uh, uh, the South to go north. And this was part of the great migration in the, post, in the war and post-war years. What then would you do with uh, the interview that we have also in our archives with the uh, former uh, slave Fountain Hughes, which took place, uh, was conducted just in 1946, a mere 14 years before uh, uh, Chuck McDougall gave, gave, uh, had his uh, moment in, in Orangeburg, in which Fountain Hughes recalls days on the slave plantations and reflections about society, not just back in, in a, uh, before the turn of the century, but about a more general condition of you know, the black folks were facing in the United States. So in, this ways, in these ways, I'm, tra I'm trying to suggest that what we do as uh, serving and when we serve up collections is to make this kind of in a backwards and forwards leap um, so that, again, we understand that the collections enable but also constrain us. Um, speaking of which, I wanted to see if I can get this particular clip up, and I will close my eyes and see if it will play. To my wife, where my wife was, and her kids. So I went out on this place and went out there, and I, well, I had a nice uniform and everything on, and I got out there, got off the train. I uh, met a white fellow that had been knowing me before I went to the army, and so he told me, he says, now, listen, boy. He says, now, you been to the army? I told him, yeah. He says, how'd you like it? I said, it's okay. He said, well, he says, you ain't in the army now. He said, those clothes you got there, so you can take them home and get out of them, get you some old home. He said, because uh, there's no nigga going to walk around here with no Uncle Sam uniform on up and down the street here, see. Say, because you got to go back to work. Well, I told him, I said, well, uh, what about, uh, uh, I haven't got any clothes. I said, all the clothes I had, I said, when I left me, and I've been gone two years. I said, I haven't got any clothes now. I haven't got any money to buy any. So he said, well, we haven't got anything to do with that, so we'll let you have some overhauls to work in. So he said, as a suit of clothes and things like that, so you don't need that nowhere until you make up for the time you've been gone. That is, uh, go to work and uh, pay for the, some of them the things that you wore before you left here. So I told him, I said, well, the things that I wore before I left me, I said, they're all worn out now and they're all gone. I said, in fact, I paid for those things once. He said, well, you 
says, uh, you still got a bill up there, though. So they give me overhauls to where to go to work, and that's all. They wouldn't, wouldn't let us have, wouldn't let me have anything, no clothes, no suits of clothes and shirts and things. Like, nothing but work shirts and work clothes. Bill, tell me a little about your first wife. You sort of skipped her, though. Well, I, I met her in, uh, in Blindsville. In the interest of time, I'm going to cut that off uh, abruptly. Um, I'm not going to foreground this particular uh, interview uh, at the moment. I'm just going to play it, and then we can uh, hopefully have a little time to discuss it. Um, this is the story of Ruby Sales, uh, one of our interviewees talking about her experiences as a 17-year-old following a demonstration in Port Deposit, Alabama, uh, which is next to Hainville, Alabama. Um, and here, uh, there's an interesting convergence of uh, various co collection materials, which um, I'm still trying to wrestle with. So uh, it's a little unformed, but I want to play this interview, and then we'll uh, see what comes of it. Uh, I think Linda Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act in, on the 6th of August, and it was just a week thereafter, I guess, that um, the Fort Deposit uh, yes. protest happened. Can you talk a little bit about how that, how that picket was, it came into being? Because I know that there were, even the, among the, the SNCC folks, people, there were... Yeah. The young people in Fort Deposit whose parents worked on plantations and were forced to shop at the local store. And because of this, they were often cheated and never realized any profit from the work that they had done all year. And the young people, the young black people, were angry at seeing their parents uh, being cheated. Not only being angry, they were on fire with movement spirit, and they wanted to play a role in changing things not only for their parents, but for Alabama and for the nation. And they suggested, they brought to us a plan where they wanted to do a demonstration. And <laughs> SNCC did not want to do that demonstration. <laughs> but how do you tell young people who are organizing and stepping forth for the first time how can you squelch their spirit and say, don't do it? The reason why we didn't want to do it is that, to be perfectly honest, we were frightened. Because not, a Fort Deposit was just a nightmare. So having made that decision, we all participated in the demonstration, which took place on Saturday morning. And when we got there, It was one of the most frightening scenes I've ever seen. It was a mob of, there was a mob of white men there. And I guess being a mob, you're undisciplined. And they had every conceivable weapon, baseball bats, garbage pails, anything it seems that they could lay their hands on, they had. And they were threatening to beat us up, kill us, and and as the day, as the time wore on, they were getting louder and less willing to hold back the violence that they threatened to unleash. And I think, I'm not sure, that we were probably arrested, not only because they did not uh, approve of what we were doing, but also somewhere I think that they realized that if they didn't get us out of there, we were gonna get killed. So we, by they I mean the white officials, we were put on a garbage can. Truck. Truck, yeah. right. <laughs> put on a garbage truck and we were taken to the jail in Hainville. When we were finally let out, the, the, the jailer just came one day and said, get out of here, you're free. It's a week later. Yes, it days. scared me to death. Now all of this is instinct. I knew that when people let you out of jail like that, that they've got something planned. 
uh, because that's what had happened to Goodman, Schwerner, and, and so I knew instinctively, but I couldn't document it, um, that something was up. And, but we went nonetheless with great protest, because they said that if we didn't get out of jail, once again, they start, started threatening us. And I said, this is really a change, people threatening you if you don't get out of jail. We got to the store, and Tom Coleman was standing in the door, and he had a gun, and it's one of these moments where you're there, but you're not there. You sort of stopped in your footsteps, but you're trying to figure out how to move. And he said, bitch, because I, I was in the front. He said, bitch, I'll blow your brains out. And the next thing I knew, I was pulled backwards and I fell, literally fell. And Jonathan, I heard a shot, and it was Jonathan. He shot Jonathan. Jonathan never made a sound. I think he was dead instantly, or in a coma instantly. Father Marsro, who was with us, the Catholic priest who had literally just come to the South uh, when Martin Luther King issued the call, held on to Joyce Bailey's hands, a local young girl at 17 years old who, was, who had been in jail. And they were running together. And the next thing I knew, there was another shot. And unlike Jonathan, Father Marsro began to emit moans and begging for water. And Joyce Bailey. Sorry, I've been asked to sort of stop it right there. So if there's any more, if there's any interest in seeing that, we can uh, take it ahead of some other time. We're out of time, so sorry. Hmm? I, no, no conclusions. The story, the story speaks for itself. Please thank Guha. Like he mentioned, um, if anybody is interested in seeing that, um, we can, you can come up afterwards and we can watch that together. Um, we have about one minute for questions, literally one minute. So um, if there are any questions, George has the microphone. Are there any questions? Wow, no questions. Yeah, let's play it. Let's play it. Was some level of consciousness still working? Headed that way and went around the, in the South you always have these cars, on empty, went around to those empty cars and called my name. And it was when she, I could hear her that I realized that I wasn't dead. Prior to that, I thought I was dead. I had no sense that Jonathan was dead, and that, but I got up on my knees. I not got up. I got on my knees and crawled over to Joyce, and we ran over to the area where the civil rights workers, where the Southern Freedom Workers still remained, and Jimmy Rogers. Gloria Larry, Ruby Sales, and Joyce Bailey went back over to try to give Father Morris a water. And Tom Coleman, like a wild man, was flinging his gun and saying he would blow our brains out if we tried to give, if we didn't leave. He let that man lay down there in the hot August sun, shot, begging for water, and threatened to kill anybody who helped him. We dispersed and ran 
in different directions. And somehow I, I, I got back to the Freedom House. And when Stokely Carmichael and Silas Norman, who was the project director of Selma, Alabama, when Silas Norman and, and Stokely heard what had happened, they went downtown. And when they got there, the streets were clean. And Jonathan and Bar Father Marjorie were missing. Now, it wasn't a simple thing of knowing where they went. For several days, the SNCC office, Ruby Doris Smith, tried to find out where they were, and nobody would tell us. So not only was Jonathan dead, he was also missing. And they talked with John Doerr of the FBI, I mean, of the Justice Department, sorry, and trying to figure, and Mrs. You can imagine his mother not knowing where he was. Um, and finally, they located uh, the morgue where Jonathan was and the hospital where Father Marshall was. Now, I don't know if, if you've heard the story of Father Marshall's story, <coughs> but he was taken to the hospital in a hearse on top of Jonathan's dead body and laid in the hospital hallway for hours before anybody would operate on him until a general, I think, or major in the U.S. Army uh, agreed to do that. So, of course, by then, we've gotten our first real lesson of Southern white murder. And we are young. Nobody's over 22. We are impressionable. We know the horrors of segregation, but we're also hopeful. We're also optimistic. And that's a defining moment, another defining moment. Um, and we were shattered and devastated and trying to make sense out of the loss of our friend John. And knowing that we had to go to the funeral, but somehow finding it hard to face his mother because he was with us. We had not done it, but we felt a great responsibility for each other. And so that was very, very hard to do that. And of course, my story is known that after then, I just became, went from a big mouth person to someone who rarely spoke. And I think I spent a great deal of my adult life without even knowing it, trying to find my voice again, um, trying to be full voiced again, uh, because, um, I shut down in ways that I didn't realize it, like with many movement people. And, and the reason why I shut down is even when I was at Princeton, even when I was at Manhattanville, even when I was out in the world doing peace and justice work, I never told anybody I'd been in the movement. I never talked about that. So traumatized was I. Let's thank all of the speakers again. If anybody has any questions, I welcome you to come up here and uh, ask Brandon, Chira, Guha, and Jolene. Thank you.